Welcome to today's webinar, Adding Value from the Straw Ford. Today we're here at Walford College where we're looking at what has been done on farm to improve not only the value of the dairy, cow, uh, dairy heifers, but also the dairy bulls and the dairy beef. We'll be joined by beef farmer Graham Parks, who has developed uh, um, a rearing system that is adding value to calves that most would probably perceive as valueless. We'll bring both um, Tom and uh, Graham together to have a discussion at the end to see what can be done within the beef industry and the dairy industry to continue adding value so both industries can maximise the values out of the calves that we're getting uh, out of our dairy cows. At the end of the webinar, all three speakers will be available to answer questions. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please put them into the Q&A box down the bottom and we'll answer them after the, um, after the webinar has finished. Um, so when we arrived here, it was only around calving herd. Um, we had a high mortality rate around 16%. Um, we had poor growth rates, heifers weren't calving down to like 30 months of age. Um, poor retention of heifers into second lactation. Um, so we knew we, need, we knew we need to have a greater focus on those areas. Um, so um, obviously then we're moving to a block carving system as well. Um, so obviously it brings us different types of challenges. So um, obviously we look at some key areas that we need to improve on the calves to obviously increase profitability and get more heifers into the herd um, and obviously get those industry targets back under control as well. So obviously the change we made along the way, um, we obviously took a great look at the environment the calves were being reared in um, as we were getting high disease uh, cases and instances in the sheds that were improved to reared in. Um, so we tried various locations on the yard around the farm where we thought we could rear the calves. Obviously we had to consider now we're moving to a block calming system and we're going to have more calves being born at once. Um, fortunately with the block calving we're going to carve the cows outside. Um, so we were able to use the old dry cow shed which is a fairly large space um, for rearing the calves. Um, so um, yeah we, that was our biggest our biggest first step obviously and we we went down the route on a dedicated calf era because um, previously we was using milking staff, whoever was available in the yard at any time to feed the calves. Um, so it wasn't really a focused, focused role as such. Um, so obviously, yeah, obviously the dedicated calf era and more attention to detail, someone passionate about calves, more focused on calves um, and take the pressure off the rest of us while we're obviously dealing with the calving. Um, made a big difference as well. Um, obviously we started weighing calves, so we started to know when we could wean the calves or when not to wean the calves. And obviously a bit of target feeding, there was some measuring the data, collecting the data, recording it. Um, and then obviously, um, yeah, which all led to a bigger, folk, biggest drop, we dropped down all those cases of inst disease instances and that's had a big impact, we reduced our antibiotic use in the calves. Um, and then high, high retention of heifers into the herd as well. Um, mortality rate been like 2% this year. Um, scour cases being below 1%. Um, and then pneumonia, very well, a bit of pneumonia, but not as much as what we were getting before. But a lot more focus on obviously healthier, healthier, happier calves in the shed. Um, so they were targeted because obviously we felt they were the ways to improve profitability, not just in the heifer room, but obviously in the herd. And the farmers in general, um, you know, calves in a block calm system, we couldn't calf heifers down at um, 30 months because it just doesn't work. So we had to hit the 24 month um, window to get these get the heifers in. Um, so they calf at front of the block, obviously, and then we would get back, higher chance of getting them back in calf. We seen that last year, where we had 96% retained um, into second lactation. Um, obviously, then the weigh in gives us better tools to manage the calves, helps to make better decisions, um, cut costs in some ways as well, because perhaps they don't need to feed calves that didn't need feeding, essentially when they're outside, we just get away and just feed them on grass. With the way in now, we're able to make better management decisions in terms of when to wean the calves, when not to wean the calves. Um, we're able to track their growth rates now through um, up to uh, bullying weight is maybe up to two years of age. Um, so like last spring we were achieving, uh, yeah last spring we were achieving between 0.8 to 1.2 kilograms of growth rate in the calves. Um, 
up to weaning. Um, this time we were um, like 0.86. Um, last autumn I think we were like 0.9 up to a kilo. Um, but obviously it enables us to know, just know whether we're doing as much as we can and where we're doing it right, whether the calves are growing at the speed we want to and then gives us that confidence that you know, we can obviously you know, reduce their feed to purchase feeds and concentrates. Um, obviously then went to wean them, so we touched on milk, um, milk powder usage and stuff like that. Um, obviously now we're in mid-January. Um, you know, we were able to weigh the calves last week um, during a vaccination we were doing on them um, and revealed that some of the calves were uh, heavier weight than others. So we made a decision last week to um, turn these calves out um, keep smaller calves in the shed on a silage and concentrate diet, whereas these calves have come out now on a grass um, and a bit of concentrate outside. So it'll take the space and the pressure off in the shed and enable the smaller bunch to, or the younger bunch, I say, to be able to catch up with these so they can turn out, they can all go out at similar heights and similar weights and, um, and again, ent enter the herd at a desirable weight and hopefully reach those industry targets as well. Okay, we're in a makeup of the pens that you normally have for your calves. Can you just talk through what's normally in here and, and why it's in here? Yeah, so this is just a, a makeup of our, what, our pens. Uh, the heifers come in here, this size of pen. Uh, we have eight in a pen at a time. Uh, the balls will go in a bigger pen because they're only here for a short period of time on the farm. They'll all go in together. Um, uh, in here, as you can see, we've got a, a trough for their corn. Uh, water and then a little rack which I put straw in um, yeah and it, obviously the straw on the floor as well. Fresh, wa uh, fresh water is important it like, gets cleaned out every day um, freshened up and topped up um, that's important to increase the dry intake. Uh, the corn I always put that fresh they have it as a on a ab lib basis um, that's always cleaned and fresh that, that I do that every day twice a day um, and then uh, the straw, that's always topped up and I always fluff it up so it's always easier for them to eat it and get it. Yeah, the corn, uh, we have that on an ablib basis. Uh, that's uh, topped up, well, topped up if they eat it, but to start with, they don't usually um, go at it. That's given to them from uh, day one. Uh, that's important to uh, increase, um, develop their rumen, sorry. Um, and the increase uh, growth rates from an early age, which we see calves from early as day seven start to mint, munch their way through the corn. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's very, very important to have it from day one, I always think. Yeah, so they're born, they're, when they're born, we bring them in, whether it's a bull or a heifer, they're all treated the same. We weigh them, uh, we'll record that information down, we'll uh, dip their navels, tag them and then obviously bull cows go in the bull pen, heifers into the heifer pen. Uh, they'll have um, colostrum, I tend to give them as much as they'll drink, some will drink up to four or five litres of, of um, colostrum. They'll then stay on the cow's milk for three days, so they'll have second milk, third milk and sometimes even fourth milk. Um, then they'll go on to powder and that's given to them twice a day, so they have three litres a day and they have it at a ratio of 150 grams of powder to a litre of, of water. The powder we use is a whey base powder. Yeah, they'll stay on that for seven weeks and then we'll weigh the youngest one. And if I achieve in our growth weight, which is 0.8, sometimes they don't always, but if the oldest ones are and the rest of the pen are, we'll still go ahead and put them on once a day. We'll just monitor that one. Um, they'll go on to, well, I'll just, when they go on to once a day, the afternoon feed just gets completely stopped. I don't do anything with it, just stop it. And then when they're on once a day, they have five litres. And then uh, they'll stay on that for about a week. And then I'll gradually go down each day. I'll drop it down two litres, and then, well, two and a half, sorry, first, then two, then once a day. They're usually eating about three, three and a half kilos of um, dry matter, um, which is brilliant which is what we want to see and then when uh, they're weaned they usually go up to about four four and a half and then when they're completely weaned off they tend to go into a, a bigger pen because uh, with block carving we have loads of calves that are weaned all the same sort of time 
and then they'll stay in there for a couple of weeks and then we'll wean them again just to make sure that they're doing what we want them to do really before they go outside. So the, the shed we use uh, is big because it used to be our old um, dry sh cow shed. Uh, we love it because it's plenty of space. I can have all the calves, like this last um, calving season, I had all the calves all in one area, which was fantastic for me. I could keep my eye on them better. Um, it's big and airy, so the calves love it because um, it, they've got plenty of space. They can all go in it. I can have my pens the nice size, so I can have eight uh, calves in the pen. Um, the draft uh, is stopped by the bales, um, but it's just just nice airflow to stop any bugs and keep them healthy and ventilated. Good ventilation in there. Tom, can you talk us through the breeding policy that you have here on the farm? So yeah, no. For the last two years, we've been um, tr obviously transitioned from an oil around carbon air to a all block carbon air. Um, so we've predominantly been using um, Jersey or crossbred semen on the um, Holstein cows and um, new cows we brought in being crossbred we've used either Frisian on those or maybe um, a bit of crossbred at times um, so we, we rear well we breed everything the first six weeks to dairy um, and then for the last six weeks we're using um, a short gestation hair of a bull yeah and so what, what has been your focus uh, really within the breeding performance through that transition so it's been fertility, easy carving, um, really, um, to be perfectly honest, yeah. Yeah. And how has that impacted on the straws that you've used? So we, we use a lot of conventional at the start, because um, we just have to cows and calf, really. Um, last couple of years we've started dipping into the use of sex semen, um, used it on the heifers last year on um, natural services. This year we did it on... Um, seed sync programs and we used a little bit of sex semen then in some of the cows as well. Yeah. And so what's the drive behind using the sex semen? For us it's reduce um guarantee of a dairy heifer, um reducing your dairy bulls, but obviously um again there were the dairy heifers having the dairy heifers at the front of the block for us, yeah. Yeah. And uh so obviously with the use of more sex semen you're gonna be using more beef. Um, what's the beef that you've been using and why? So we've been um, using a short gestation Hereford bull. Um, one, they're easy carving, um, and um, it's not it's not too difficult to get mixed up with a um, with the dairy calves. Um, but also, um, it's tightening the carving block up as well. Yeah. And so, what's the outlet you have? for your dairy beef and dairy, uh, dairy bulls? So um, we, uh, we, we tried a little bit in the market at the start last year and then we ended up finding a buyer um, to take all our uh, dairy bulls and beef calves. Yeah, and how are you finding that? It works really well. Um, you know, it saves us a lot of work at a busy time of the year. Um, you know, we don't have, get charged commission and things like that and um, it's just good good working relationship to me and a, another farmer um so yeah no, it works really well yeah and what sort of age are you selling those calves off so those calves are getting around two weeks of age yeah so it's clearing out your shed so you've got more room for your yeah, heifers it's enabling our calf rear to have a, a more focus on the heifer calves which is for a dairy farm and like ourselves is where our focus should be yeah we've done some figures in that so what what is the break-even margin that you need to get for your calves to be um, break even? So at two weeks I need, um, obviously on a feeding the calves uh, raw milk, we need to uh, make about 15 pound on the dairy calves ahead, and on the beef calves we need to make 60. Yeah. And is it achievable? Yeah, I, believe, I think so. I mean, it's a reasonable price. Um, you know, I think mean, there's an outlet at the end for those calves as well, so I don't see why, it shouldn't be why anyone should uh, argue with buying that buying those calves at that price yeah um does tb impact on your system here at all yeah it, it, obviously we're at, we're restricted then with moving the bull calves off it creates potentially a lot more work um you know if we go to an afu they'd have to move all at the same time so we'd have to retain those calves for a lot longer that incur more cost and more work um but then also the, the value of the calves actually drops as well 
Um, cause, uh, last spring you, you retained a lot of, uh, spring born calves, um, when you were down with TB, how did yeah. that end up working out for you? Um, so we were low stocking rate, we were down with the cow numbers anyway, and, um, the cows were out as well. Our open calves were out after that. So it was just literally, we had these spring calves inside. Um, so it wasn't too bad. And just before they were born, we actually had one clear test. So the, the thinking was, oh, perhaps we're gonna have another clear test. So we took the chance and the, or if you like the risk and um, it turned out to be the right decision at the time. The calves uh, made on a, <clears throat> made a bit more money in the market later on. Um, obviously the rearing cost was low. We kept them, at, we kept them inside and obviously on milk and then they went outside um, on grass and reduced that cost quite considerably. So you'd look to do that going forward um, now that you're fully in autumn block or would you uh, look to go down the AFU unit again? I think for us as an autumn block I don't think it's something viable because obviously shed space um, every animal's coming in so it creates more work um, you know potentially to more problems, more costs, um, more, you know, so I don't think it's something we'd look to do. I mean, you know, we could get TB again, so we'd have to assess options, but we probably, again, I might just put the calves into a red market and, you know, your first loss sometimes is your best loss and that might be the attitude we'd have to take to it. Yeah. So Graham, can you give us an overview of your, uh, your beef rearing system that you run? Yeah, um, basically got a 300 acre grass farm on, at Macatood on the edge of the Pennines. It's an all beef farm, I buy 250, 260 calves a year, and I take them through to finishing. Uh, I buy all my calves in one bunch, it makes my life a lot easier. Uh, you know, calf rearing's done in about 10 weeks, and the rest of the year is a lot easier, for, you know, a better lifestyle. Um, basically, I buy, yeah, 250, 260 calves. I go once a week to two dairy farms, I pick all the beef calves up we've got, incorporate predominantly Angus, but it's Herefords, Fusilaires, Black and Whites, Odd Herefords. Uh, I don't mind what breed. Um, and they're all reared together. I put them in bunches of 40 to 42 in a pen. Um, and they reared on a milk, uh, I feed them twice a day for four weeks. And they fed on a milk buggy. Um, then after four to six weeks, they go on to once a day corn intake increases rapidly and then after that they weaned. If it's any odd small calves uh, I will pull them back to uh, another bunch but on the whole most calves go through the system very well. Another two weeks after that they turned out and then they are rotationally block grazed for the summer. They'll still get a kilo of corn at grass for the first summer and come um, first of November I'll bring the perhaps 100 smallest into the sheds, 150, 160 outside on crops and big bales. I aim to turn out again the following spring, around about 1st of March, well I need to empty the sheds for the calves, so 1st of March I'll go out, I split them into two groups, bullocks and heifers. We kept like that for the second summer, second winter, steers are outwintered on big bales, the heifers brought into onto uh, cubicles and clamp silage. Um, hopefully turn them out first of March, and then um, I aim to start finishing. I'll keep them separate, steers and heifers. I'll aim to start finishing mid June, and I will start putting a bit of corn into, especially the steers, in mid June. Uh, and I hope, aim to get more gone by first of November. And what did this? Uh, what did this system appeal to you? <coughs> a system. Originally, I was on a dairy farm that went down the grazing route and I realised how easy it was and how much better performance you can get out of your grass. So I tried it with my beef. You know, I've been doing it 20 years and I love it and I wouldn't do anything else. Yeah. Um, and so the dairy farms that you're buying off of, what are their cow tops predominantly? Uh, two farms I'm buying from are crossbred cows and they've both got a fair bit of jersey influence in the cows. Um, so I have the calves as they come and 
they're obviously um, grazing cows and the calves do suit the system, the grazing system. So, so the, the cow type doesn't worry you? No, the cow type doesn't worry me. Um, so I'll rear them through to finishing. I have, if I was sending them to ABP, I wouldn't be rearing the calves as rearing because of the electronic grading does not like grass-fed, crossbred animals because they're too small. All my cattle, because they're Dumbia, the Hayfords go on the Hayfords scheme, the Angus go on the Angus scheme, and they do the commercials. They can go all go on the same load. Now, Dumbia don't pay quite as much as the other abattoirs for the premiums, but the cattle grade better at Dumbia, majority being O plus 4Ls, and they get more R grades than they've ever had at Dumbia. So yes, they pay a little bit less, but we have to grade better, and it makes my life, there's not too many hoops to jump through. Yeah. And um, so, do all your cattle go down the the finishing route, or do some of them end up being sold as stores? Um, some some get some years have to sell them all finished. It depends on my TB status. Uh, last year, I did sell 80 privately to a, f a finisher. And he was happy with the 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 composition of the cat of the beef animals. He was obviously very happy because he actually picked out all the black and whites. He had two artic loads of me, and he picked out all the black and whites that went on those two artic loads. And there was Angus, there was Harry for there he could have picked from. Um, so they obviously suited this system. Yeah. So what do you pay for the calves, and why have you picked the farms that you are buying off of? buy through? I pay between 50 and 100 pounds. Um, what we do is I agree a price per life and it's has to come whether the heifers, bulls or whatever breed. I will pay a bit less for black and whites. Um, one farm will pay 60, another farm will pay 80 and I will pay 100, up to 100 pound depending on the, what I'm buying. And the reason I go to those two in particular farms is calves are all like colostrum. They look, they fed as well as the heifer calves. They've had colostrum, uh, paperwork's correct, they fit to travel, uh, and because the calves go on well, at one time we used to buy calves out of the auction, mortality rate was regularly up to 10%, now bad year is over 2%. My mortality is down to 0.5 to 2 percent, which I'm very pleased about. Yeah. And the calves are just healthier and go on. They, they, they suit the system. I. Yeah. Uh, I do. Um, so why do you choose the calves you choose? One, they've all had colostrum. The two dairy farms I go to have looked after them as well as they do the heifer calves. Low disease risk. Um, big numbers from a known source. I can go once a week, fill my trailer, because they're in bunches of 40. I like to, the quicker I can fill my unit up, the better. So the block carving systems do suit me. Um, paperwork is correct, and obviously the predominantly Aberdeen Angus, which is the, the breed I rear the most calves of. Um, they're easy to rear, because they've already come out of a grass-based system. And the one stipulation I have is the fit to travel. As long as they fit to travel, I will pick up every calf, good or bad. So, so is your business resilient enough to withstand the loss of BPS payments? Yes. The BPS payment is a bonus, and which makes me you know, a very healthy profit. Yes, my income will be down, but I'm confident I will still make a, a useful profit. Right, the one thing I do, I'm a one-man unit, I do employ labour one day a week to do my stewardship work that I've, ta I've taken on. Um, but the reason, one of the reasons why I buy all my calves in one big bunch is I rear the calves twice a day up until they're all weaned. After that, I'm happy for somebody else to go and feed them. But the critical bit is the calf rearing. Um, so, but I do keep me simple, very system. Keep me simple, very si simple. You know, it takes about 20 minutes bunch to feed 40 to 42 calves um, and it's only for a few weeks and I like to rear my calves like I do so uh, it gives me you know plenty of time off during the summer and just makes life a lot easier during the winter months. 
Um, what would be, or do you think this is a good opportunity for other beef farmers to target these calves, which some people perceive as don't have a value in the beef market? There's definitely an opportunity to target these calves. Uh, one big, uh, big benefit is you don't have to go to the auction. Yes, the calves are a bit less money than the auction, and you can get, you know, you can load up three, four hours, you can go and get a load of calves of a similar quality. Yes, they might, might not be the same high, quite as high standards you'd buy it to the auction, but they do the job. Do you know where your beef ends up going uh, in the supply chain? Yes. <coughs> the Herefords go to the uh, Sains Sainsbury's Hereford scheme. The Aberdeen Angus present are going into Liddle and the commercial beef can go anywhere, wherever they're se selling. Yeah. And um, how does your system uh, help with the resilience? Like you said that you obviously don't need the BPS payment, but how does the system help with that resilience? Uh, my system, well, because I'm rotation the block grazing for certainly a minimum of eight months per year, you know, I can keep my costs down, considerably down, and concentrates are not, a, you know, I know they've gone up in price, but I don't use that many concentrates for a finished animal. Um, so what is the average price you're receiving for your beef? Uh, this year, it's... Uh, around about four pound a kilo average price. Majority of my cattle are graded at O plus 4L. There's a few R grades, and I, if I get less than half a dozen O minuses. Um, you know, two years ago, I was on three pound 20 average, and that was break even. But now, yes, four pound, I'm comfortable with that. But going forward, I think the housewife has got to get used to paying more for the, the meat she buys, and four pound a kilo is, is only just enough with all the uh, present inflation involved in farming. Um, so Graham, looking at these financial figures, uh, it's clear to see that you're not getting the same prices for your beef, car, uh, beef cattle that you're selling, but you're making a better margin. Um, can you just talk us through how you're managing to achieve that? Um, but calves are a lower price because they take the good with the bad. Uh, they're economical to rear, they have very little concentrate. The grass fed, uh, and very little co concentrate for finishing. Um, so all in all, keep my costs down and I've got a higher stocking rate. And that's where I feel I'm making the margins from. Yeah. And uh, so sort of going forward, you, you can see yourself maintaining those margins or getting them bigger or better? Oh, going forward, I'm aiming to improve on those margins. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. So you, so you want to be? There's room for improvement. Yeah. I'm pleased with where I am. I want to go better. Yeah. So you want to be sort of up in that premium group or above? Above, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. To maximise the value out of calves that are coming from the dairy industry, the beef industry and the dairy industry need to start working together to ensure that what's happening at the dairy level is flowing through value into the beef level. So that's why I brought together Tom Moore and Graham Parks to bring the perspective of their uh, industries together. So therefore we can start working together to add value to the calves and ultimately uh, ensure that every calf can go through the supply chain. So how have you managed to get your relationship with your farmers and Graham? Well I've been very fortunate, I've been in the grazing group when I was milking cows on the dairy farm, I've got a lot of contacts through that and uh, it's word of mouth and I, you know, I go in with a, with a well, I think it's a good deal, you know, buy all the, the block carving and I'll take all the calves off and one with the good with the bad. Yeah. Now I know some beef farmers want calves all the year round, but there's plenty of all the year round dairy farmers calving cows. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, let's hope TB doesn't cause an issue for them. That can be a problem, but uh, I'm sure there's plenty of opportunities out there for beef farmers to make contact with an appropriate dairy farmer yeah. for the calves they want. Uh, because calves going through the auction, you know, my mortality has reduced tremendously through not buying calves through the auction. It's time consuming. There's an expense for the dairy farmer of uh, <coughs> obviously haulage and commission. And it's, you know, it's very easy when I go once, very easy for them when I go once a week with a trailer and just load all the car the calves are already and I just load them all up. Yeah, well, I, I, same for us. Like, we, um, you know, at the height of carving when we're busy and we've got calves hitting the ground left, right, and centre, last we want to do is travel into market, which some, well, at the minute, Shrewsbury's 10 minutes, 15 minutes away, but 
like the drain could be another half an hour on top of that so we don't want to consume our time so it's great for us to have someone who can pick calves up and take them off our hands and obviously you want less commission and stuff and things like that yeah and i've noticed with block calvers now you want to get rid of those calves as soon as you can just to relieve the pressure of yeah. the number of calves you're feeding uh, you know i'm now 40 minutes away from the nearest auction and i was going to the auction every week i could struggle to get five calves i might get 20. Yeah. whereas i know i'm going to get a set number of calves and a set number of weeks yeah it makes my life a lot easier yeah yeah oh, it's better for everybody all around i think yeah so I, people like that. i just like to do my calf ring once a year and then you know it makes life my life easier for the rest of the year so how do you think other people can pick up on a relationship like that then, Graham, or are the, are the opportunities there for, you know, going forward for people, do you think, or? Oh, the opportunities are definitely there. You know, I mean, one, more than one grazing group, mm. uh, you know, passed it to profit on Facebook, and, uh, position grazing, grazing group. Uh, unfortunately, there have been some of the dairy grazing groups as well in the past, and that's where I've made me contacts. Um, but if people want, that if you want something, just go out there and look. It's there. You've yeah. just got to make the effort. Word of mouth is a fantastic way of uh, finding out about these opportunities. Yeah. So you rear spring calves. Would you ever consider taking on autumn calves as well? Or? I used to rear a bunch in spring and a bunch in autumn. Um, obviously, there's high cost associated with autumn calves. And there's a dairy farm that said to me, says, why don't you rear all your calves in spring? And I just thought about it and thought, you're dead right. And that's what I've done ever since. Yeah. Um, yeah, Graham, so what, what are you looking for then in your calves when you go out and buying them or uh, whether it be the market or your farms or? Uh, I'd never go to a market. Uh, basically, the mortality has always, always been higher when I purchase calves out of the market. So it's a more time consuming, more time consuming. Uh, I, I do like, Buying direct from the farmer, you pick up once a week, you go there, load up, come back, less stress for the calves, and um, yeah, it just makes everybody's life much easier. Yeah. And obviously, there's no cost to the dairy farmer on haulage and commission. Yeah, I suppose so, you know where the calves are coming from as well. I know where the calves are coming, exactly where the calves are coming from, yeah. and it's just a saving the haulage and commission and time for the dairy farmer. Yeah. So, um, there's only desirable traits you're after uh, that the industry, beef industry, would probably prefer from a dairy farmer or? Well, good, good confirmation goes a long way in buying a calf. Um, I'm not worried about size. You know, if a calf has come out of a heifer, it's just got all the world to grow in and it will grow. Uh, the last thing I want is too much Jersey influencing calves. Hmm. You know, 25%, no more of Jersey influence. Uh, all it does is make it difficult to get the uh, have the beef heifers to wait for, for slaughter. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I understand what you mean. Going but like from a dairy farmer's pers perspective, um, we're after easy carving animal, and um, sometimes confirmation gets compromised and um, stuff like that. But is there any certain breed that um, that you prefer personally, or is it? Yeah, I quite, <coughs> quite understand where you're coming from with the confirmation. Mm. Uh, to be honest, uh, I sell my cattle O plus 4L or an mm. O plus 3 is perfectly good enough and I'm more than happy with the price I mm. get for those cattle. They do not have to be the R grades or better. Yeah. So as long as it's a decent commercial calf, mm. I've got a good outlet for them. Is there a preference in like birth weight or your calves you want? Or? I have weighed calves in the past and I, it doesn't make a scrap a difference. Yeah. Uh, Bull calves will always come out heavy in the nephers. Uh, regarding breeds, I use, I use, I've got Angus, I've got Abouty Galloways, Herefords, um, which make the most, it, it, does, it doesn't make a difference. It's no, it doesn't matter what breed they are within reason. Yeah. And, and the calves I'm looking for are from the block carvers and they are, you know, they come out in grass-fed cows, and I want to be grass-fed calves because mm. I find that's the best way to make me a decent margin. Yeah. I'm also fortunate I've got a position I can set up an isolation unit, so should one of my dairy farms go down with TB, uh, it's yeah, it's just a bit of paperwork and uh, set my isolation unit, a bit of work to do, set my isolation unit up, 
but I proceed from there and I have such a good relationship, I do pay the same price, I don't uh, deduct uh, no, va uh, no less value for uh, TB calves. Yeah, I suppose the challenge is we find our TB calves have dropped the value, so it makes it a bit more difficult, we try to be keep clear of TB and try and add some value to the calves at the same time. Uh -huh. Right, Tom, what is the challenge for yourself if you do go down with TB regarding your calves? Well, with us being on calving, we'd have to obviously keep them in longer, um, but we'd have to retain them for longer, it incurs our cost. Um, we have got a sensible amount of shed space, but it put pressure on the rest of the system with all the rest of the, anim rest of the animals coming in during the winter as well. Um, so we put a bit of pressure on that way, so, so ways we have a, yeah, we'd have probably have to put them to a red market and then we'd probably lose some value on them as well. So it's it's one of them where we'd have to make a decision at the time, but fortunately with clear TV at the minute. So. But it is an unfortunate thing, but even if they're spring born and you go down, uh, and they go into an isolation unit, they do have to be housed for uh, yeah. f four months minimum. Yeah, uh, but I'd, I have, the rest of our stock would be out. So less pressure on the, on the, on the, shed on the space. system yeah, and less labor yeah. cost. And um, so it, yeah, it would, yeah, it would be slightly different on that aspect, yeah. Yes, here you wouldn't be able to set up an isolation unit because one of the main criteria is that it's got to be a shed that's isolated from the farm mm. and have its own access. It cannot be a shared access you now off, off the main yard. Mm. Yeah, uh, I'm in the fortunate position. I have got an isolation unit and uh, can resurrect it at fairly short notice should one of the two dairy farms that supply with me calves go down with TB. Yeah. Um, there are some implications, i.e. you've got six weeks to put the calves into an isolation unit and you shut it up, 60 days after that you have to have your first test and 60 days after that your second test and both tests have to be clear before the calves can go out to the unit. So unfortunately it does include some additional costs obviously housing the cattle, especially myself when I'm on a grass-based system. Yeah, well I suppose then you're not losing your calves coming through, you've still got a steady chain. Yeah, I've still got the mi supply as, as normal. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, all the calves that have gone into an isolation unit, they all, they've all passed the test, it's never mm. been an issue. Yeah. Bearing in mind, our calves here, we, we weigh everything at birth, if it be bull, uh, bull or heifer. Um, yeah, everything receives at least three to four litres of colostrum. Uh, it's all recorded um, and stuff like that. Um, you know, they're the sort of calves you'd be looking for, potentially, or? I'd take any beef calves, bulls or heifers, yeah. out of the dairy herd, as long as you block calving, yeah. and the calves have had the same treatment as your yeah. heifer calves would for replacements. Yeah, so we, for the first six weeks, obviously we use dairy bull, dairy semen, um, but obviously it's a bit sexy with the heifers and um, we put a crossbred on a Holstein and a Frisian back on a, a crossbred. Um, but then obviously in the last six weeks we're using beef semen at the back of the block. Is, would those dairy bulls be any value to you? Or? Yeah, I have got no problem taking black and white or mm. crossbred dairy bulls. I've read them in the past, They're just as profitable as the Angus and the, uh, any other beef breeds have got. So like we, we use Jersey on the Holsteins here as well, Graham. So, um, now, would that jersey, that first cross jersey calf, be any use to you? Or? If it's come off a whole, big Holstein cow, I won't have a problem taking that calf. But obviously, if you're using sex semen, you won't expect too many of them. So, no. <laughs> yeah, that would be fine. But yeah, definitely, I think autumn calves, a little bit more work involved in terms of getting to the point where you can turn them out to grass and stuff like that. I mean, I think, yeah, it could depend on the breed of the calf at the end of the day. But, yeah, yeah, there's definitely more costs associated with the autumn calves. Mm. Um, but spring calves are the most economical calves to rear. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, you know, um, we've had issues with TB in the, like obviously TB in the past, and we nearly we was point well we had to put calves into red markets or AFUs, and we found that you know, thirty percent of the value was going in those calves, and um, you know there's, there's a point in the calves are going to make a loss, and obviously a lot of people are going to face those pressures, aren't they, going forward? And, um, yeah, this, and this is where I have a, you know, a very good relationship. Uh, I have two dairy, two dairy farms I buy from, one's in the TB4, so that shouldn't be an issue. But the other farm, you know, 50% 50, 50 of the years have been going, mm. they are shut up with TB. I've got an isolation unit, and the calves have to go into the isolation unit. I don't drop the price, I pay the same price, whether the 
shut up with TB or are they not shut up with TB? Yeah. And that, it's all part of the good relationship. Yeah, no, it's, it's key, isn't it? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I think, you know, for us to break even on carbs, we were working out this morning um, for our half a car, well, for our dairy bulls, if they were to make 15 pound, um, no, the beef carbs will have to do at least 60 to you know to break it break it even on a just keep them for two weeks at the point of the passport turning up so, so it makes a big difference to if someone's willing to pay that extra money or to keep the same money going in and you not take that pressure off you when you're trying to concentrate on other things at that time on the dairy farm yeah because i mean the reason i do pay the same with they shut up with tb because they'll guarantee me the calves if calves are very dear mm. one spring they they don't suddenly put the price up mm. It's that relationship. They know the following year they could be shut up with TV. Yeah. And now come, still come back and take those calves. Yeah. With that then, Graham, how did you run your isolation unit or how did you get it as well? Or? well I was very fortunate. Uh, when I was having the sheds built, I was had to have some uh, soil tipped. Um, yes, the company fetched that much soil. It was <laughs> unreal. And unintentionally, they put another access into my shed. And it, but it's been a godsend because to have an isolation unit, you need a shed with its own access. It cannot be off the main yard. It's badger proof, or wildlife proof, I should say. Um, and once the calves are in there, they're in there. I've got to take, put all the feed in beforehand. And you know, you've got to have the washing facilities as you go into the shed. Uh, yes, it's, there's an increased cost in rearing the calves because you can't, you've got to keep them in for an extra 120 days. Yeah. And have two clear TB tests. Yeah. Um, TB testing is not an issue anyway because I'm on six monthly testing anyway. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, we obviously we can't do anything like here, and I mean we've tried before to try and get um, calves into an isolation unit, but yeah, it's it's just the yeah, as it's always been the cost of actually what the calf was worth at the end, yeah. and then the cost of rearing that calf, and um, yeah, it's always been like decision that well we might be better to go to a red market or we lose the cost or we'll lose it earlier uh, yeah first loss is the best loss don't <laughs> yeah but i you know i do know better quality but calves off people who've been shut up with tb mm. yes there's a slight deduction but they've been pleased with what uh better quality mm. paid yeah but it's sad in the way that you know these calves are going to the market going to a red market or nice sometimes into an ice station not like yourself and There'll be a reduction in the value, but there's not a reduction in the value at the end when they're finished. No, there's no reduction in the value, no. no. But, we, you know, <coughs> I have got higher costs keeping them inside for that extra 120 days. Yeah. Especially when I could be outside feeding cheap, <laughs> cheap grass. Very true. But so, yeah, obviously not every system's like your system though, is it? Where some, car, some animals will just stay inside anyway, I suppose. Yeah, but unfortunately I am, I've got the... Uh, <laughs> Animals that like to eat grass, you know, out of the, the, de the herds that uh, are focused yeah. on milk from forage. And so the young stock yeah. do do well. And uh, it's not ideal putting them in the shed for 120 days, but uh, you've got to, you know, that's what it is, and you can't do anything about it. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Tom, <laughs> would you be interested in uh, letting the beef farmer have a say in what uh, uh, beef straws were used on your cows to get them in calf? Um. I don't know if I'll let a beef farmer have a total say what was used, but I think we'd have to come to an agreement because, like, at the end of the day, I still need a cow that's a calf that's going to give me an easy carving. Um, you know, for us, we're using the um, Jersey Cross semen and stuff like that. Obviously, so we need something we couldn't use an Angus in that sense because you, know, you get two black calves and tell which one's beef and which one's dairy. I broke it, some broken marking on it to identify the marking, or we'd have a week of like doing perhaps we'd. Perhaps a week out of it, and then we'd put Angus on or something like that, um, just to be sure. But um, yeah, I think I know it, it's something that could work potentially going forward, but yeah, it'd have to suit both parties a little bit as well. Um, you know, I wouldn't want Belgian blues on the back end of the block no. when you're trying to get the cows back in calf. I do prefer if you've used uh, an AI bull, mm. that those calves too tend to be better than the stock bulls you've used. Yeah. But then there are some very good stock bulls about throw them at the end of the new good cattle. Yeah. Thank you, Tom, Kate and Graham for your input on this webinar today. 
Uh, we'll now, in a minute, uh, open up for questions. So if you've got any questions, please put them in, in the Q&A box down the bottom and we'll get the panel to answer them. Uh, but before we do that, I'll just uh, put forward my uh, key take-home messages that I got from the information you guys provided today. Um, the first being that uh, every calf needs colostrum and a good rearing environment um, from, the, from the start uh, for that, for enable them to grow into any value. Um, and that's irrespective of their breed and gender. And then the other one being uh, creating a good relationship between uh, beef and dairy farmers uh, can also lead to a win-win situation for both industries. Um, but this also requires the need for um, a use of bulls that meets the requirements um, of the breeding and rearing um, of both businesses. Um, so we'll um, open it up to questions. And uh, the first one is um, to you, Tom. Uh, and the question is, um, are you using six juicy semen? Um, and if not, why? Um, we used a bit and a half as this year. Um, not really used it in the cows. We've just been more focused on um, fertility and forming a block while we've still been in transition from all your own carbonate to an open block carbonate. To be fair. Yeah. Um, and then the next one's to you, Kate, is uh, where did you learn uh, to calf rear? Uh, mainly for my mom and my nan. Uh, we've had livestock all our lives, really, so it's pretty much just been drummed into me from a very, very early age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And other day. just learned so. through trial and error. Uh, some of it's been trial and error, yeah. Um, but uh, most of it's all been handed down knowledge and that and what I've learned on the job as well. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, Graham. There's a question here for you. Um, are all the farmers in your monitoring group are running the same system as you? I know very few people that are running the same system as me. Most people tend to keep the calves in a lot longer. I get them out as quick as they can once they're weaned and straight onto rotational block grazing. There isn't that many big farmers rotational block grazing anyway. So, so that's a no that you pretty much yeah. anyone in that group. So no, no, no. Yeah. no, no all good. Um, there's another question here for you, Graham. Um, have you looked at running like bull beef instead of steering the the bulls? Um, bull. No, I haven't, and I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't want bulls. A because when I buy calves, I buy bulls and heifers mixed. So the last thing I want is uh, older calves, you know, uh, weanling, um, yearlings getting in calf. Uh, and bulls, as if, I have done bulls in the past, but they've always have been on a serotype diet, not a, not a forage diet. And I am looking for cattle that uh, utilise forage to the best ability. And I don't think bulls do this. Very good. Um, Kate, there's a question here for you, um, which is uh, just asking, what would you change with the setup that you have on the farm there? Um, like, is there anything you'd change to make it run better? Um, personally, I think it all works really, really well. Um, so the only thing I would change to make my life a bit easier this time around is to have automatic water drinkers in. But we are talking and hopefully working towards getting that this year. So, yeah, but other than that, Everything works really, really well. I'm happy with how we've all got it set up. Yeah, I know, very good. And um, there's another question here for you, Kate. Um, yeah. Do you change the feed rates for the smaller car? Or do you all get the same same rate? Uh, the smaller ones, we tend to just keep them on a on on milk for a bit longer. But other than that, that's the only change we do. Um, they're all they all have the same amount of corn and everything. They just stay on milk for probably one, two weeks longer. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, and Tom, so um, you sort of touched on this a little bit through the um, through the webinar there, but uh, why don't you rear the bull and beef calves uh, through longer to increase the value of them? Um, it's just with being autumn block carving, just um, winter costs post weaning. Um, obviously, you know, milk powder costs rising as well now. Um, so that's another impact we have NVZs with NVZs so to be able to keep hold of those animals we, you know we've turned them out and then the stocking rate as well 
Um, you know, I touched the video, we had low stock rate, but stock rate's up to where we had desired numbers now, so they have an impact on milk production. Um, so that's probably why we wouldn't keep all of them, to be fair. Yeah. All right, fair enough. Um, and then a uh, question here for you again, Graham. Uh, do you tie in your silage and concentrates that you use through the winter uh, to feed the cattle? Well, I've used uh, very little concentrates this winter. Uh, the R1s, the smallest 100 R1s, I've had one and a half kilos of concentrates. The other 170 have been outside on big bales and stubble turnips. And I do use concentrate for finishing my cattle, or especially the steers. They do appreciate a, bit, a little bit of concentrate, but obviously um, they've all gone. So, uh, yeah, I tend to feed concentrates in the autumn with a snacker just to get finish my cattle off and get them gone. Yeah. All right. And so the, the soldiers that you, or the other feeds that you feed the cattle, that's all homegrown, is it then? So now, yes, it's all homegrown. Uh, for the last two years, it's been ho totally homegrown. Uh, I used to buy a lot of forage in and, uh, uh, years gone by, but the quality of the, the forage is, is far superior uh, with what I make myself than what I used to buy in. And I've noticed that, you know, it does definitely benefit to the cattle with better quality forage. All right, very good. Um, and so Tom, there's a question here for you. Um, with the mixed size of your herd now, um, how do you know that the growth rates that you're achieving are going to meet your requirements for block carbon? Um, <clears throat> we're just working off an adult weight of 600 kilo animals, so um, they always get that 60% breeding and then we're back from there, really. Um, that's how we're just monitoring and managing it at the present moment in time. Yeah, I know. Very good. And I'm guessing you're meeting those targets? Uh, we have done so far. We've gone, you know, we've gone past those targets as well. Um, calves have grown at an exceptionally good rate in the last couple of years. So, yeah, that's been going pretty well. Yeah, I know. Very good. Um, well, that's all the questions we have through at the moment. So just... Uh, We'll leave it open for a little bit longer. If anyone else has any more questions that they want to ask, um, please yeah, go ahead and ask them. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, I'll put out a question for myself then to um, to you guys, um, or mainly to Tom and uh, Graham, uh, after the conversation <laughs> with you guys. Uh, is there anything you're going to look to do different going forward with your um, your straw use or the where you're selling and buying? Do you want me to answer that? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm very happy with the system I've got. Uh, and yeah, no, I'm not looking to alter anything. Yes, if something comes up, and uh, I'm always looking for new ideas, but I'm very pleased with how we've got the system set up. Some is there any changes you're going to make after the conversation with Graham? Uh, probably find a better value for my calves. <laughs> so I've seen what great impatient, but yeah. Yeah. About it. All right. So you're going to try and foster some some relationships that will give you a bit, bit of a price. Yeah. I know what the going rate is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Very good. Oh, well, um, no more questions have come through at this stage. So, um, uh, we'll call it uh, call it a day. We're um, just about on time anyway. So, yeah, uh, thanks again, guys, for participating in the webinar. And thanks, everyone, for uh, joining on today and the questions that have come through. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave it there. All right, thank you. Thanks.